Well, welcome once more to Living Faith. We are still talking about the Living Covenant. And we covered some good ground, I would think, so far in this lesson. And then we were talking about how we get our names in the world. And it, all it takes is faith in Jesus Christ. That is all. Okay, if you believe, if you say, Jesus, I believe you, I believe in you, and I receive everything that you have done for me. You know, when you believe in Jesus Christ, He gives you the power. The Bible says, to all those who believe in Him, He gave them the power to become children of God. You understand? So what happens? When you become a child of a family, what happens? Your name automatically goes into the world. You understand what I'm saying? So it's not a, it's not a major thing. There's no real major uh, extra effort. Or a different step you need to take. No, it's all in one package. When you receive Jesus Christ as Lord, you receive all the privileges of a family, of all the privileges from the Father, and all the benefits of being the family of God. All right, we've seen that before, but we were looking at some of the covenant benefits, and I tell you what, it can take us a long time, really, to look at the benefits because there's so many. All right, uh, I'm not sure we'll be able to cover a lot. Uh, or oh, we're going to cover everything, but we're going to have to cover the key ones. Because these key benefits that we have received from the day we received Christ into our hearts, from the day we, from the day we became children of God, there are some key elements that we have to know. That is the reason why, that's the main reason why many, many Christians suffer things they shouldn't suffer. You understand? I'm not saying that you wouldn't find problems in the world. You will. Jesus said, you know, in the world you'll find tribulation. Why? Because the devil is here. But he said, he didn't stop there. He said, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. So he didn't say, no, you're going to have it soft in the world, you know. You're going to have a red carpet treatment every day and everywhere you go. No, no. He says, you must expect tribulation. But some people suffer unnecessarily. Especially in the area of lack and poverty. They suffer unnecessarily. They are victims to their upbringing or their culture or their family culture. You know, whatever they taught and whatever they were cultured with at home and as they were growing up. For various reasons, people suffer certain things which they shouldn't even suffer because their covenant has taken care of that. You understand? It has been taken care of. The benefits of the covenant are so many and so powerful. But as I said, we're going to just deal with those key ones as we get into them. And we just started off in the last session we read from Ephesians 3. We're going to go back there right now from verse 14 to verse uh, 21. All right, now Paul, the apostle, this wonderful man of God, is now talking to the church in Ephesus and he's saying to them, this is what he's saying. He says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15 from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Can you see that? All right? The father and then the family. So what's, the, what's going on here? From God the Father, through Jesus Christ, the whole family in heaven and earth is what? Named. Do you understand that? I like what David said in Psalm 20. He says, Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. But I will remember the name of the Lord my God. You understand? That's faith. I mean, that bold faith. So now, it says, firstly, our names are now in, in, in heaven. You know, uh, I, I wrote a song, you know, uh, you the reason to live for. And I started off that song with the understanding of, from the Song of Solomon. And where it spoke about our, our oneness with Christ. And, uh, and the first uh, verse of the song speaks about my identity. That I'm known by a different identity from the day He called me. And I'm never the same. And forever I will be known by your name. Okay, that's the first verse of that song. Now, uh, when you get that song into this understanding now, you realize, hang on, hey, there's something going on here. That God, the Father has done much more than I know. So I need to know what he did. So first thing, we are called by his name. We have a name change. People might call us whatever they want to call us here on the earth. But God our Father has a name. 
All right, the whole family in heaven and earth is named by him. All right, please understand that. Because that is the, that is the fine print. That is the stamp of approval. That is finality. That's God's great approval for all of us that call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 16. All right, that he would grant you. This is what Paul the Apostle, Apostle is praying. All right, he says, I'm on my knees before God for you, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That he, may, that he would grant you. All right, see the key. But see, look at the words clearly. Don't speed, speed read this. Read it slowly. Take each word. Okay, that he would grant you, right? According to what? According to the riches of his glory. That is something that is still a mystery to a large degree in the body of Christ. And I'm digging into this right now about the glory of God. In fact, I started last year already focusing very much on the glory and a few other things. And that's when the Holy Spirit started to minister to me about the glory and what is in the glory. And every time the glory of God is mentioned in this kind of a context, the word riches is always there. It's always accompanying that word. We just read that on, in, the, in the last session in, in Philippians 4, right? My God shall supply all of my needs. According to what? According to his riches in glory. Listen to what the apostle is saying here now. That God, by whom you are named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be what? Strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, in your spirit man. Strength in the inner man is very, very important. Many people are miserable because the inner man is close to death. Spirit, soul, and body. You know, if you, some of you did that course in Bible college, you understand. If you feed the body, it will get fat. Right? And then if you feed the spirit man, he will get fat. He will get healthy. Some people's body is well fed, but the spirit man is hungry. He is hardly fed. Now you must understand, he don't eat the food that the body needs. His food is God's word. So when we don't study the word and we don't read the word and dissect the word and understand the word, the spirit man is suffering and weak. He has no strength. So Paul is praying such a deep and serious prayer here. He says, you know, I'm on my knees before God for you. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one through whom you, all the family in heaven and earth is named. I'm praying that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. You understand? So where the key lies here? It lies in the inner man. People are weak in the inner man. In order for us to fully, my understanding is this, in order for us to fully use the benefits of this eternal covenant, we've got to be strong spiritually. In other words, our spirit man, our inner man, has to be stronger than he is right now. All right? So let's go to verse 17. That Christ, now this is the reason why your inner man needs to be strong. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, in God's love. You are rooted, you are grounded in God's love. Right? So firstly, that he will grant you strength in your inner man. And that he, that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you may be granted, uh, rather uh, rooted and grounded uh, with, uh, uh, in the love of God. Rooted and grounded in the love of God. Alright? And I know many Christians are not there. You ask them, you know God loves you? Yeah. It's so casual. But they don't know the depth. You know? They don't know the, 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 the depth. You know, we... <laughs> I listened to a song that is sung by, a, I think, a seven or an eight-year-old child from India. She sings a song, you know, on another level altogether. And nobody can actually, uh, actually um, compete with her. 
She's the main singer of that song. That song was written for her. She is the lead singer of the song. All right? It's her song. The title of it is Nenika Pitu. Now I went and looked into that word. The word Pitu means explosion. It's talking about the power of God's, the explosion of God's power, of God's love. The explosion of the power of God's love. That's, I mean, near yeah, eight-year-old, seven or eight-year-old. He's singing a song of that level in India. So they're getting to understand, if ever I believe there's a nation right now that is getting deep into the love of God, is that nation. I mean, you must listen to the music, you listen to their worship, and the understanding they have of the love of God. And I think in the Western world, we think it's a feeling, we think it's a song that we sing, it's some kind of music we play, some kind of cliche we quote. But no, no, we need to understand the power of His love. Verse 18. May, may be able to comprehend now, see, so many things is in motion here for now, for you now. All right. So firstly, you will be strengthened in them in a man, and then you will be rooted and grounded in the love of God, so that you may be able in verse eighteen, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. Verse nineteen. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So you can see how powerful this covenant is. It has been sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It has been ratified by His blood, the great shepherd of the sheep. But this entire covenant is based on God's love. As I was meditating on this a few weeks ago in the office, and I said, Lord, there's so much of wickedness, there's so much of sin on the earth, there's so much of evil here, there's so much of evil people here, there's so many people that are criticizing the church, attacking the church, attacking its leaders, there's so many people are falling away, and you are just, you are still so patient. And the Bible says that God is long-suffering, all right, and patient not willing that anyone perishes. Can you see his love? I don't know if I was God, if I would be that tolerant. <laughs> I mean, his love. It's all because of his love. Everything is because of his love. Everything. Salvation is because of his love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Every single thing. The covenant is because of his love. We are called by his name. That is because of his love. We are strengthened in the inner man. That is because of his love. Now we comprehend Comprehend. You know what the word comprehend means? You understand. You fully understand the love of God. Some people suffer and struggle with comprehension. They can't comprehend simple things. You understand? But the love of God is more simpler than simple things. Believe me. Understanding the love of God is more simpler than simple things. So I'd like to encourage everyone, everyone who's listening to this message, Try and comprehend. Pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you the love of our Father. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> we don't have what it takes to measure the love of God. How high, how deep, how wide, how long this love is. We don't have. But by the Spirit of God and by prayer and by meditating on it, at least we will journey to a certain degree in the love of God our Father. Verse 20. Now to Him, listen to this, now to Him, to God our Father, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us. What power? The power of His love. The power of the Father's love. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. You know, you can't use the two words in one sentence regarding anyone. Not one single person I know can do exceedingly abundantly. You cannot, you, you cannot describe anybody with that two words. Beside God our Father. Isn't that amazing? Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Above all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work in us. So why should we comprehend the love of God? 
Because the love of God is the very foundation of this covenant. It's a love covenant. It's a love, this blood covenant, this eternal covenant that we're talking about, is a love affair. You understand? It's based purely on the love of God. It has been sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ, but it's everything about this covenant, the very foundation of this covenant, is the love of God. This whole covenant is built on the platform of God's love. Okay, many people live and walk and, you know, they strive in life. Very hard things, uh, you know, uh, they live a very difficult life. They find things to be very hard and difficult in this world. And this is the message they need to hear. This is the message they need to hear. They need to hear and know, understand and comprehend what the love of God is and how powerful it is. So, the next time you go before God and you pray regarding your needs, please remember this scripture here, that God is able because of His love for you. We can't measure His love. We can't even comprehend His love. Okay, but Paul is praying that the church will, will be able to comprehend. I don't think we have the capacity to comprehend the love of God. It is too powerful. It's a, the most powerful force ever. All right, it is more powerful than any other force you can, you can know. The force of the power of God, of the love of God, rather. Okay, the power of God is the love of God, the most powerful force on the earth. So remember this scripture, that your name is in that, in, in, in that will. This, this, this privilege, this is a privilege. This is a benefit. The love of God is a benefit, and based on the love of God, according to the power of God's love that is at work in us, our Father God is able to do exceedingly abundantly, above what we all ask or even think. Verse 21. To Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Why? Because this is an eternal covenant. This covenant will never come to an end. It's the same covenant that God spoke about and it's the same covenant that's going to take us right into eternity. And all the nut and bolts of that covenant has to do with the love of God. Everything is solidified with the love of God. Everything is cemented. Everything is put into place. Everything is engraved in stone. Whatever you want to call it. Nothing can ever change it. Nothing. Because it's not based on what we have done. It's not based on our faith. Okay, initially it was our faith that received Christ. You understand? But this, what we're talking about now, is not just based on our faith. It's based on trust, which is much deeper than faith. You understand? It's much deeper. It's based on trust. What are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in? Well, you're trusting in God. What are you trusting in? In, in the power of His love. So just major on that in your life. But don't make it, don't, 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 don't water it down. You understand? That's why I, say, I don't like to listen to some, some songs where they sing about the love of God. I don't like to because it's so watered down. Make it sound as if it's some kind of an emotional thing. You know, like a we, we, like, you know, like a seesaw kind of thing. Up and down, up and down. It's like, it's got nothing to do with that. It's, 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 not a, it's not an emotional thing. God's love for us is a practical thing. God so loved the world that He gave. God's love is always giving to His children. So the whole love covenant, the whole eternal covenant, we can call it love covenant as well. The whole eternal covenant, which is a love covenant, is based on the power of God's love. And God's love always gives. To Him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So now we're just going to jump over from there. we we'll go to Second Peter chapter 1. This letter is from Simon Peter. From verse 1 we're going to read. This letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. So he's writing to Christians, people that share the same faith that, they, that he had. All right? This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and our Savior. All right? So you must understand that God is a God of righteousness and justice. 
You know, in the sight of God, every sin has to be punished. Are you aware? Because He's a God of righteousness and justice. That is why every sinner will be punished for his sin. But in Christ Jesus, He paid for our sin. So we won't be punished for our sin. Do you understand that? We won't be punished for our sin. Because somebody died for my sins. Somebody died for your sins. I am washed by His blood. I'm cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That is why the Bible says you must confess your sins. So that you can be cleansed. Christians need to learn that. You know, and people, if you offend somebody, please go and apologize. I know what Christians do. They go pray. God is not asking you to, when you offend somebody and do something wrong, you must go pray. You need to go and apologize. You need to go and tell them you're sorry. It's, it's, it's not, it's, believe me, believe me, children of God, it's not easy to live a clean, it's not hard to live a clean life. It's more difficult to live a corrupted life. Because then you've got to please yourself. Then you've got to please everybody. Then you've got to look righteous. Then you've got to, you know, look as if you've got everything in intact, but your wheels are coming off. It's more difficult to do that, to hold your life together in the life of corruption, than living a clean life. If you're wrong and you did something and you didn't, you know, made a mistake or whatever it is, it's so easy to just go and say, yeah, I did this. I'm sorry. I apologize for it. You know, and uh, try and read, you know, can I, can I make retribution? Can I pay you for it or do something? Now that is, it's, it's such, so, so much more to live like that, easy to live like that. So much more because then that person you offended or that person that you harmed won't have any grudge in their heart for you anymore because you made it right. You understand? So this whole thing uh, about God being righteous and justice, we has to be part of us also. We've got to also walk like righteous, and people, righteous people and people with justice. Not like, you know, one of the things that comes in to, to us in this world as children of God is accusation. Two things, actually. It's accusation. They always will accuse us of things, all right, and then they will persecute us. Jesus promised that these two things you'll always find here on this planet. But you can't be, you know, swayed by that because it's coming with the trend in this corrupted world. So this faith, Peter says here, this faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and our Savior. Why? Because he shed his blood. So what was the demand of God? That his sins must be paid for. Jesus Christ paid for it. And through his blood, we now have the righteousness and the justice of God in our lives. We walk, we live according to that. All right, verse 2. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Alright? So he says, again he's praying, he's saying, May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. <laughs> Do you think people desire that? To grow in the knowledge of God? Oh, I need to know more about God. I need to know. I'll tell you if, you, if you find someone like that, that's a gem. That's a gem. If a person has that in art, hey, I need to know more about God. Then one of the things you'll always find with them is, a, is the Bible. Because nobody can ever know more about God. You can listen to a million preachers and still not know much about God. You understand? So you need to, only the Bible can actually give you more knowledge about God. So, but he's praying that God will give you grace, all right, and peace. God will give you more and more grace. In other words, grace will be growing upon you, all right? Firstly, for the knowledge. Now, le le let me bring this in quickly. When you, get to, when you get the knowledge of God, when you grow in the knowledge of God, and when the grace of God is manifesting in your life more and more, and when you come and you get more and more grace, and peace, okay, as you grow in the knowledge of God, you also grow in the knowledge of the covenant. Then you start understanding this covenant love. Then you understand that God, our Father, never withheld anything from you. Then you realize that suffering, you're suffering. You shouldn't even be suffering this. You're suffering because you have lack of knowledge. The Bible even says people perish because of their lack of knowledge, because they don't know. 
But what you and I have to do, we have to get to know. So the more we get to know God, the more we understand God's love, the more we get to know this covenant of love. Okay? Go, let's go to verse 3. By His divine power, by God's divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. How you like that? Hmm? How you like that statement? So in other words, you want to live a godly life? <laughs> By God's divine power. God has given you and me everything I need or you will need for living a godly life. There is no excuse. There's no excuse to live the way people live. That corrupted life, as I said to you, it is more stressful to live that life. It's easier to live this life. The godly life. You understand? It's easier to live this life here. So God, by His divine power, has given you everything. Has given us everything we need to live a godly life. Alright? And that, that, everything God has provided is all in that covenant. Okay? It's all in that covenant. We received all of this by what? By coming to know Him, the one who called us to Himself, by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. Can you see that again? That word glory. Can you see that word glory there again? Alright? Uh, we received all of this by coming to know Him. Right? Coming to know God our Father through Jesus Christ. The one who called us to Himself. God called us to Himself through Jesus. By means of His marvelous glory and excellence. God's perfection. God's perfect love, God's excellent love, God's indescribable love, God's indescribable glory. The word glory actually means fullness, God's fullness. We've come into God's marvelous fullness and excellence. All right, verse 4. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. Again. That word promises cover the entire covenant. Because the whole covenant is a covenant of promise and fulfillment. Alright? Through Christ Jesus. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share His divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Can you see that? You can't find a more perfect scripture than this to describe the state of the world right now, to describe how Christians actually live right now, the level of corruption to a point you can't even imagine. The world is the most corrupted place right now than ever in history. As I said to you, you know, a few weeks ago, this is a new path the, road is going, the world is going down. We never passed this way before. The world has not passed this way before. The world has gone through many, many seasons. But this one path that we're down right now, in these last days, we've not passed this way before. The world was corrupted before, in the days of Noah, in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. But right now, I think it's actually bypassed that. It's gone past Noah's days. Because the level of corruption, and what makes it serious, and why I'm saying that is, because that high level of that corruption is in the body of Christ. It's in the church. It's in the body. You see how Christians behave. You watch how they behave, you see, yeah, the things they're doing. I mean, alcohol abuse, cigarette abuse, I mean, these are the things. They, they, that's the world. The whole world is made up of that. The whole, the whole world. I'm, talking about now, I'm not talking about the worldly people. I'm not talking about people unsaved. I'm talking about Christian people. They live the most filthiest lives. They live the most filthiest lives would know absolutely no glory to God. And because of God's glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share His divine nature, God's divine nature, here on the earth right now, and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. So in other words, God is, God is your source, right? God is your source. God is your supplier. Okay? Can you settle with that in your mind, in your life, and say, right, God is my source. God is my source. God is my supplier. Can you just settle with that? 
It's important that you settle with that. I'll tell you why. It's because if you do not settle with that, you'll be looking elsewhere. And looking elsewhere can take you into the place of corruption. You know, the Bible says, whatsoever you desire, delight yourself in the Lord, the scripture says, and God will give you all the desires of your heart. So why should we go into the corrupted world now to get the desires met? Are you listening? So when we live and share God's divine nature, then we can escape this corrupted world and all this human desires that is there. It's a shame that people will, with the same mouth, worship God and sing a song to Him, and in the same mouth they will do something else. It's such a sad thing. You know, uh, a little while ago I went to Home Affairs to pick up my passport, and we could hear, before the doors opened, we could hear they got loud music, worship music, and they, all of the officials were singing and worshipping the Lord. It went on for about five minutes or so. Okay, now I'm standing in front of me, there's another lady. There's an African lady standing in front of me. And she saying, these people are praying. I said, yes. I said, I said to her, at least they got one thing right. She's saying, yeah, but when you go in there, they're different people. They're praying and they're singing now. When you go into their office, their attitudes stink. Why do they don't carry this throughout the day? Now that's how Christians are. Oh, we'll pray and we'll sing and worship God and we'll have a blessed day. But somebody else comes into your life, you make their life a misery. You give them attitude. Now that's, that's, a kind, that's a level of corruption we're living with right now. Let's go to verse 5, please. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. How are you like that? In view of all that, you know the corruption, you know these things that are happening, you know you have the divine nature of God. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. How do you respond to God's promises? Firstly, you get to know God's promises. If you don't know God's promises, you cannot respond to it. So you need to get into the Bible. You need to read the blueprint. You need to read about the covenant. You need to go into this great adventure of God's love. You need to find out the power of His love. You've got to have to do this. You've got to put some effort into it. All right? So make, in view of this, uh, all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge. All right, so he says, sub supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. Now, that's what some of the people don't know. That if you're a person of faith, you have good moral standing. You can't tell me that you're a person of faith and you believe in God for the whole world. But your character stinks. You can't tell me that that, that can gel together. Listen to what this prophet, uh, apostle is saying. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. So let your walk be excellent. Let it be clean. Have an excellent spirit. Walk in forgiveness. Live righteously. Do what is right. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence. And then supplement your moral excellence with knowledge. Verse 6. And supplement your knowledge with self-control. Wow. Many Christians don't know this is there in the Bible. That you've got to supplement your knowledge with self-control. So in other words, you know the truth. What did Jesus say? You know the truth, it will set you free. Alright, you know the truth. So then why behave like the rest of the people in the world? If you know the truth, if you're standing out for the truth, why should you compromise the truth and listen to others? And follow the trends of this world. No, you've got to have self-control because you know the truth. So when someone says, let's all go and do this, you must ask why. You must ask why. Why, should, why must I go and do this? No, because that and that. No, no. I am now, my faith and my trust is in a living God. He is my source. I live according to the, the covenant of His love. That is sealed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I trust Him for my divine provisions. I trust Him for this and I trust Him for that. So that is self-control. In other words, you've got control over your life and your faith. You're using your faith in the right places. And supplement your self-control with patient endurance. Some people think uh, faith is rash. You, you act rashfully if you've got faith. No. Faith requires patience and endurance. You know that? 
Faith requires patience and endurance. Only God knows for how many years I'm being patient and, and enduring what I am for, for the promise that is before me. Abraham waited 25 years. Moses waited for 40 years. Are you listening? People wait for a long time. With what? With patient endurance. So you supplement your knowledge with self-control. You supplement your self-control with patient endurance. And you supplement your patient endurance with godliness. So in other words, let's just God, let God just woos out of you. Let everyone know that you're a godly person. You understand? Let's go to verse 7. And supplement your godliness with brotherly affection. And supplement your brotherly affection with love for everyone. In other words, do good for everyone. It, we always, whenever we talk about faith, when we talk about pleasing God, when we talk about the love of God, when we talk about the benefits of the covenant, we we'll always land up in this situation where we have to love other people, where we have to, have, we have to care for other people where we have to provide for other people. You understand, it's about doing good, it's about being kind. That's what, that's, that's the bottom line. Many people say, well, I'm so blessed. I'm so blessed to be a blessing. But they're never a blessing. Because I'm telling you, the church is packed with cliches. And you will see it on the status, you will see it here, you will see it there, you will hear them quoting it. And I just laugh at them because these are not scriptures. they got no power in it. So blessed to be a blessing, okay? Show me, show me what you did today. Show me wh what you did today, that you were a blessing. Some people are just a blessing to themselves. More and more for 2024. You heard them saying that now. They got a new one now. God, give me more and more for 2024. But you're not doing anything for anybody else. You understand? You're not doing anything for anyone else. You affected nobody's life at all. Your whole life, some people. They have not done anything. And it's just, it's the, when you tell them to do something good for somebody else, they respond in the most negative way possible. And but that's the one will tell you, you know, the best is yet, yet to come for me. Look at the principles of God's word and look at what the covenant is saying. And live that principles. Yes, you're living by the love of God our Father. But the love of God our Father is not an emotional love. It's a love that does things for you and you must in turn do things for people. So that's the brotherly love. With that brotherly affection, okay, substitute your brotherly affection with brotherly affection, with love for everybody, for everyone. Do things for someone. Find someone tomorrow and do something for them. Find out what someone is going through. You know, and see whether you can help. Go out of your way if you have to. Spend your money if you have to. Say, yeah, but what about me? What about me? Yeah, everybody lives like that. That's the part of the corruption of the church. What about me? What about me? What about me? Let me ask you a question. What about the covenant? What about the love of God? What about now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above you or all you ask or think? What about that? No, it's you, the... the, 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 the this is what people say. What about me? What about me? If I give this, this is the last one I got. God wants you to give the last one. Understand? He wants you to give the last one then because He can give you more. I only got this. I don't know. I am keeping this for next week. Those people are not people of faith. Those people are not covenant people. They're not. You give what you have today and God will take care of you next week. That's how, cover that's how you live your covenant life. I'm living this every single day. I just put an homeless person into an home today. And I paid my money for it. My account money. To do that. I'm not just sitting, standing here and talking to you and ministering to you, not doing anything. I'm using the last cent, last penny that I have to do what I'm, what I'm teaching you. That is why my faith is so strong in Him. That is why I believe from the riches of His glory I will receive. Because I believe so much in that covenant. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.